Hey everybody, it's Gianno Caldwell. You may know me as a national political analyst, but today I'm here to tell you about my new podcast series, Out Loud with Gianno Caldwell, the sworn enemy of PC culture. I'll interview national guests from all walks of life and real people discussing issues on culture and politics, as well as the controversies that have social media blazing. Listen to Out Loud with Gianno Caldwell every Monday on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. When it comes to what's happening in this country and around the world, the best podcast you can listen to is The Buck Sexton Show. Hey, it's Buck Sexton here. We are in the height of an election season that will determine the future of the country. Who are you going to listen to? Who can you trust? Who could have thought that when people told Democrats they had to treat Wisconsin like a battleground, they would take it quite so literally? iHeartRadio is number one for podcasts, and it's easy to see why. Listen to The Buck Saxon Show on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, this is Newt. Due to the virus, I'm recording from home, so you may notice a difference in audio quality. On this episode of Newt's World, he grew up on the south side of Chicago, on streets filled with violence, poverty, and drugs. One of nine children raised by grandparents as his mother battled an addiction to crack. John O. Caldwell armed himself with faith, conservative values, and an unrelenting spirit to achieve his dreams and become the sworn enemy of politically correct culture. You know, I want to just share with all of you that at Gingrich 360, we've evolved so that in addition to consulting and thinking about issues and opportunities for America, both at home and abroad, we develop content across all platforms and partnerships so that you and like-minded personalities have a chance to really develop and hear new ideas, new people, and new information. We want to become a home for mentoring and amplifying people with important and entertaining ideas to share. We created the Gingrich 360 Podcast Network with iHeartMedia, a content platform where we find strong voices and personalities in today's conservative arena and produce new podcasts and television series. Focusing on the conservative experience by finding and bringing you thought leaders who are millennials, Gen Z, and from underrepresented communities. That's because we believe we need to grow the next generation of conservative leaders and personalities across all of America. One of the first people that we talked with who we're really excited by is my guest today. Gianna Caldwell is a Fox News political analyst, author of Taken for Granted, How Conservatism Can Win Back the Americans That Liberalism Failed, and the successful owner of Caldwell Strategic Consulting, a bipartisan firm in Washington, D.C., that provides strategic advice and consulting in the areas of public affairs. He is now the host of Out Loud with Gianna Caldwell, a new weekly podcast series we are producing that I strongly urge you to download and listen to. At the end of the podcast, we're going to share a portion of Out Loud to give you a sample of what you can expect. Gianna, welcome to the Gingrich 360 family. I am so glad to be producing your new show. And you have personally such an amazing story. Could you share with our listeners just how you grew up and how you got to be where you are today? Well, first and foremost, Speaker, thank you so much for bringing me into the family. It's such an honor to be with someone who I respected for a number of years. I became a conservative well over a decade ago, but I can tell you for sure it was with the influence in which you provided as Speaker of the House when you worked on the welfare reform legislation of the 90s it uh, really changed my life and it has such a strong impact from a policy standpoint, which encouraged my desire to be a conservative even more, to know that a person can have been on welfare, but certainly pull themselves out of those conditions and truly make something of themselves. So thank you and a very big round of applause to you, Speaker. Well, thank you. So I'm curious, what was it that led you to search for conservatism? How old were you at that time? So at that time, I was in my late teens. And to be honest with you, I grew up in a household of Democrats, the neighborhoods in which we resided in on the south side of Chicago. There was nothing but Democrats around. So therefore, what people talked about with regards to politics was all I knew at that particular time. 
I remember engaging in a conversation with the African-American fellow on the south side of Chicago one day and repeating the same anthem, if you will, about Republicans that I heard from my teachers, from my parents, from my cousins, from just about anyone that I came in contact with, which was Republicans are racist. They don't care about poor people. They don't care about black people. And this African-American gentleman, interestingly enough, stopped me. He stopped me in my tracks and he began to say things that I'd never heard before. He told me that the first African-Americans that got involved in politics were conservatives. We're talking about members of Congress, Senate, governors, mayors. He said that MLK was a Republican. And he mentioned a number of other individuals who were African-Americans that were Republicans. And I never heard this before. I never heard that MLK was, in fact, a conservative. I never heard that the first leaders in politics, they're African-Americans, were conservatives. And honestly, I thought this guy was lying to me. And especially when he said MLK, someone who we as a country respect so much, to say that he was someone which people in my community made the false accusations of Republicans in the conservative movement being racist. I just couldn't believe it. But whenever I'm challenged, I go and research so I can have a stronger argument later. And that's probably what makes me good on Fox News, because I want to make sure that I have the facts to bring to the conversation later. And what I discovered by doing a simple Google search during those days, differences, distinctions between Democrats and Republicans. When I saw the history of the Republican Party started in 1854 in opposition to the Kansas Nebraska Act, when I saw the values, which we call traditional family values, a lot of us, the values of faith, family, the fact that we want to see businesses grow and thrive. When I saw those values, it began to reflect into me immediately. I thought I was looking in a mirror and it was from that moment after I realized, wow, I am, in fact, the conservative and the Republican Party reflects me more than any Democratic Party has ever reflected me, I began to become a little depressed because after being taught this all these years that Republicans are racist, I'm like, wow, am I now racist? Like, what's going on? And that's what began the journey for me in the conservative movement. That's really amazing. When you talk about growing up, looking back now, what was it like in your teenage years to be living on the south side of Chicago? You know, interestingly enough, if I were to take that question and even go further back before my teenage years, I grew up on the south side of Chicago extremely poor. The lights, the gas, the water was off at the same time, oftentimes, all together. My mom, who I think she tried, but she got caught up into drug use, crack cocaine to be specific. And we lived in the projects at one particular time. I remember leaving school one day and getting beat up by the gangs there because they wanted me to join the gang so badly and I refused to. And interestingly enough, my grandmother, her mom, ended up saving our lives, moving us outside the projects into the house with her. And she was trying to get my mom back to some normal state. She wanted us to be a cohesive family. Well, things only got worse with my mom to the point that my grandmother demanded that she give over custody of me and my siblings and go into rehab. And at that particular point, that's when things really begin to change. And I thought going in a positive direction, but something happened which changed the pathway of my grandmother's life. She was leaving the garage one day because she was a private duty nurse. She was going to work. And as she exited and got down the road, a drunk driver hit her car and completely disabled her to the point that she couldn't work anymore. So now she's in a house with me and my siblings and she's gotten temporary custody of us, but now she can't afford to work. She can't work because of her health, her condition and being disabled. So we got on all these government assistance programs. My grandmother ended up having an option of either keep your home or lose your home to foreclosure by taking care of us. And she chose the latter, she chose us. But things really spiraled out of control. I remember moving every couple of years or even in some cases every year because couldn't afford the rent. So now maybe the house is about to be foreclosed upon. And I just couldn't imagine how could we ever live in conditions like this continuously. And I wanted to do something to change where things were going in our lives. And I did something I think was fairly different for a 14-year-old at that particular time. I was blessed to have my dad 
in my life. He would pick me up on the weekends and take me to his parents' house where we would do catfish and spaghetti. I know it's a little different. <laughs> Perhaps our audience is more of a Southern thing and, and then this, adding the spaghetti into the catfish <laughs> is a Chicago <laughs> thing. So it was different, but I got used to that. Now catfish is my favorite dish, honestly. But this one particular Saturday, I was about 14 years old. My grandfather, he would wake me up every Saturday and take me to work with him. He would pay me $10 a day to hold the flashlight hand tools because he was in small business, plumbing construction business. And this one particular day, we're riding through this area of Chicago called Inglewood, which is one of the hardest hit areas in terms of the drugs and the violence. And as we're riding through this area, I see this lady and it really took my breath away because she looked drugged up and beat down. And I just knew that I saw my mother. And at that point, the tears began to flow down my eyes. I mean, dropping, but not so much where his water works. And I tried to hide my face from my grandfather. And in this very Southern voice, he says to me, what's wrong with you, boy? And as we're riding by, I looked and I realized that the lady who I saw was not my mother, but it absolutely could have been. And I say to my grandfather, what can I do to prevent this from happening? Then he begins to tell me about the elected officials, the power they have, to increase the penalty law for those who sell and distribute drugs and how they can provide grant funding for those who want to be rehabilitated. And I said at that point, I want to be an elected official. And the very next week, I started volunteering for my local alderman's office, and that's how I got involved in politics. That's wild. So what was it like helping an alderman in Chicago? Well, it was a different experience. This particular alderman, I felt like she, in a lot of ways, cared about the people. I know that in some cases, it may not have fully resonated with people. I've seen her occupy different spaces and how she engaged with the public, but at the same time, there was a lot of people in our community that was still hurting. And what I ended up seeing from just that experience is engaging with other elected officials who clearly didn't care. They gave a good line to the black residents in the community every election year about how they're trying to do this, that, and the other. They would point back to the white politicians who were Democrats also and say that they're holding up opportunities for our community. And it was always a blame game. And in the state of politics, it shouldn't be about pointing fingers. It should be about providing solutions. So if I go back to the welfare reform of 96, in which you put together, Speaker, you put together a real solution for people, people who grew up in communities like me, who just wanted an opportunity, because more often than not, we know that welfare is supposed to be temporary. But if you believe that you're going to have the rug snatched from under you as soon as you get going with a job, how many people will feel motivated to do that? They want to feel protected and have some stability. What you created, Speaker, was real stability for people and for people who may not be aware of what you did, just to give a very brief synopsis, it allowed folks who were receiving welfare to either go to school or get a job, and you can work this job for a period of time before the income you receive from that job counted against you. In addition to that, there was child care provided, I believe for single mothers who needed to have someone look after their child while they were in school or work. That's real opportunity. That's real conservatism at work. The government is in use for a temporary period of time, but ultimately you are responsible for your own success. And that's why I can't thank you enough, Speaker. That is what we were trying to accomplish. And it did lead to people going to work. It led to changing the welfare offices into employment offices. It actually led to the largest number of young people getting out of poverty as children in American history because people went to work, their incomes went up, and we were doing better. I have to go back and ask you for a moment, though. I hope you don't mind. How is your mother today? My mom is doing a lot better. She's completely and totally recovered. She was on drugs from about the age I was about eight or nine into my 20s. And when I wrote the book, Taken for Granted, I had to sit down with her and have these very uncomfortable conversations. Honestly, Speaker, people didn't really get interested in my story, even as a conservative from the South Side of Chicago, until 2016 when I started appearing on Fox News Channel. That's when the radio stations and everyone are saying, hey, how could this guy be an African American conservative coming from this kind of environment? And it's typically something that we don't see. And I'm proud to be an example of conservatism in action because I think there's so many other folks 
that are in the African-American community that would be happy to be a part of the movement. They just don't see anyone that look like them a part of it. And that's part of the reason why I think what you're doing here at Gingrich 360 is so important because you're exposing all elements of conservatism, especially those who may not be privy to it. They may not have an understanding of it. They may not know that being who you are, you don't lose your identity by being a conservative. You actually amplify it. And if you look at the polling, most African-Americans often say that they're conservative. They just don't vote that way. And that's when we change our rhetoric and we have compassionate people and we show that. And I think President Trump, in a lot of ways, and I know there's going to be people that disagree with me, I think he's done a lot of great things for the African-American community. And most importantly, has been the most impactful president for the African-American community from a policy standpoint that we've ever seen in my lifetime and, and generations before me. So I'm really, really excited about what we're doing here at the Gingrich 360. And I hope people will really subscribe to my podcast, Out Loud with Gianno Caldwell, and certainly follow me on social media. Hi, this is Newt. I want to invite you to sign up for a yearly subscription to my Inner Circle Membership Club. We're in a critical time in our history where the outcome of the next election will set us in a course of two very different American futures. As a member of my Inner Circle, you'll receive exclusive invitations to join my video conferences with 2020 election updates and my analysis of the upcoming presidential debates. Here's a special offer for my podcast listeners. Join my inner circle today at newtsinnercircle.com. And if you sign up for a one or two year membership, you'll receive a free inner circle challenge coin, exclusive to 500 members only as part of your membership welcome package. And as an inner circle member, you'll receive an invitation to attend my members only event, Live with Newt, a discussion on the vice presidential debate on Thursday, October 8th at 12 p.m. And there are many other benefits of membership. Sign up for a one or two year membership today at NewtsInnerCircle.com. That's NewtsInnerCircle.com. Support for this podcast comes from AT&T. 5G from AT&T is fast, reliable, secure, and nationwide. So, should you switch? Well, historically, those were the reasons new tech was adopted. Neanderthals saw that fire heated things fast and made their caves secure from rampaging woolly mammoths. The ancient Romans saw that the aqueducts were a reliable and fast way to transport water, so they stopped carrying water jugs on their backs and adopted them nationwide. Oh, and uh, 1800s Victorians saw electricity light up rooms fast and be more reliable than candles blowing out, so they stopped bumping into walls and made it nationwide. Today is no different. Switching to AT&T 5G is kind of a no-brainer. I mean, historically speaking, it's smarter than candles, water pots, and hungry dinosaurs. AT&T 5G. It's not complicated. 5G requires compatible plan may not be in your area. See att.com slash 5G for you for details. How do you go about battling politically correct culture? I think that this PC culture, which was really amplified by the Obama administration, where you really can't say what you believe, what you feel, what you think, because you may hurt someone's feelings or the mainstream disagrees with you so much. And it's gotten so bad that you see people who can't even say that they support the president without the possibility of getting fired or losing customers. This has eroded the real freedoms that we have been guaranteed in the Constitution, the freedom of speech, the freedom to have one's opinion, you can have disagreements on the floor of the House of Representatives with your colleagues, and then you can go have a drink and a steak with them after and laugh and talk and still be friends. That doesn't really exist much anymore. When I go on television and I defend the president on a topic, when I say what he's done for African-Americans, I can't tell you how many quote unquote friends that I had who said, you know what, I can no longer be friends with you. And this is in spite of the fact that a lot of folks left me <laughs> when I decided to be a conservative, I had friends that said they didn't want anything to do with me or even my family for that matter. 
So with Out Loud with Gianno Caldwell, we want to have an intellectually honest conversation with people. It at times will be very provocative. It may be things that they may or may not disagree with, but I am always going to tell you the truth. I am going to tell you the truth from my lens and perspective, which I think is very unique for most conservatives. Not all the time Trump or whoever may be right. I'll tell you what I think and I'll tell you why. I may say Trump is right when everyone else says that he's wrong. Whoever the candidate or whatever the issue is, you can count on me to not give you the politically correct narrative, which a lot of us been baked into, especially young people today. Young people today have completely lost their way. A lot of us, not all of us, but certainly a lot of young people today have lost their way and now living in a universe which I don't think most of us can really identify at this point. One example that's gotten a lot of publicity where you've had a politically correct debate underway is the National Football League. First of all, how do you think it's been affected? And I'm guessing that you're a Bears fan. Uh, <laughs> I'm a fan of everything Chicago, but the violence, the debt, and the Democratic Party. This was a painful conversation with me because I own a share of Green Bay stock, but I'm going to try <laughs> to rise above this kind of petty rivalry. How do you think the NFL has been affected by all these cultural pressures? You know, what's interesting on my first episode, Out Loud with Gianno Caldwell, we have Herschel Walker, which I encourage everyone to listen to, of course, subscribe, download for this free podcast. But Herschel provided some really strong insights. Now, let me give you my insight. I think that it is okay for players to protest. I think that football is a business. Therefore, you have to respect the rules of the organization. If I come to work for you and you have a set of rules in place for me, that I either should follow them or go somewhere else, leave. At the same time, for those who chose to protest, my next question is, what are you doing beyond just protesting and using this as a publicity push? Because I've seen a lot of players try to raise their name ID by protesting and making these very political messages that are a lot of times rooted in the Democratic Party policy platform. So beyond that, what are you doing? Are you going on the Hill to talk to members of Congress about changes that you want to see put forth? Are you working with the administration on criminal justice reform? Are you working with the administration on police reform? What are you doing? I'm not questioning the fact that people can legitimately feel the way that they feel. I just think that there's a time and a place for it. And once you get the attention, what do you do to keep moving the ball forward? That will always be my question. And I've seen a lot of people just use it as a political movement to raise their value and brand. I have to tell you, I'm very impressed from a Georgia perspective that you have Herschel Walker coming on. People will love it. I'm telling you, Herschel is someone who's lighting up the political stage and just telling it how it is. He's just giving his truth. And a lot of us, I know, can see beyond some of the things, the political messaging that we've seen on television and on social media. It's important to take a real strong look at these things and not just buy into them. And that's what the left will have us do. That's why the PC culture has become so powerful, because it's a culture that doesn't give you the right to think for yourself. This isn't something that says, hey, be a free thinker. This is think what I think and say what I say. And that's your only choice. You have no other opportunity but to think what I think and say what I deem is appropriate. That's what they want. They want us to capitulate to that narrative and free people just can't do that. Hey, it's Buck Sexton here. We are in the height of an election season that will determine the future of the country. Who are you going to listen to? Who can you trust? Join me in the Freedom Hut, the one place where you know you'll get the straight story from a conservative perspective. Joe Biden, somebody who's been a machine politician, the Democrat Party from Delaware for longer than I've been alive. And nobody thought he was impressive. No one thought he had great leadership until about five minutes ago. They're trying to fool you. They're trying to pull off a con, a fraud against America. And Joe Biden is the con man in chief. The biggest names and the heaviest hitters in politics, trust me. So we've done a lot, Buck, and we have some great support. Your viewpoint is very important to me. Very, very important. That's how we got to know each other. Buck Sexton, formerly of the CIA. Buck, it's great to be back on the Buck Sexton Show. iHeartRadio is number one for podcasts, and it's easy to see why. Listen to the Buck Sexton Show on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, everybody, it's Gianno Caldwell 
You may know me as a national political analyst, but today I'm here to tell you about my new podcast series, Out Loud with Gianno Caldwell, the sworn enemy of PC culture. I'll interview national guests from all walks of life and real people discussing issues on culture and politics, as well as the controversies that have social media blazing. Listen to Out Loud with Gianno Caldwell every Monday on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcast. Why do you think that you're really a pioneer that you don't have more African Americans embracing conservatism? It's twofold. One, we had never had within our party this level of outreach to the African American community that I've seen since President Trump. Even going back to candidate Trump in 2016, that every rally that you saw him at, he was talking about black issues. They've taken your vote for granted. They don't care about you. Look at your schools. And people didn't like it because it wasn't politically correct and it sounded very harsh. But the truth of the matter is they have taken our votes for granted many, many times. You talk about African-Americans voting 90 percent plus for Democrats, but yet and still look at the communities in which some of us reside in. Look at the policies. These policies, especially when it comes to welfare, aren't meant to raise you up out of poverty. They're meant to lock you in. That's what they want. They want full on government dependency. Therefore, I throw you a little bit of a bone, not a whole bone, but a little bit of a bone and you can continue to vote us in. Truthfully, black lives don't matter to Democrats. Black votes matter to Democrats. And that's all that's ever mattered. And interestingly enough, I'm so shocked and surprised to see the Democrats have put up Joe Biden as their candidate, especially considering the fact that President Trump said something that was so true. Joe Biden is the worst politician, I think, Black folks have ever experienced. Why the 94 crime bill, which I think has impacted millions of African Americans, the recidivism rate after that was over 75%. It didn't make things better. There was no real investment into communities. And even while he was running for president this time around, what is his third time, this time around, he still didn't have any policies that spoke to the Black experience. President Trump did. He didn't just have policies in terms of this is what. I plan to do or this is what I may do, he's actually done it, which makes an enormous difference. Now with going back to your question, how can you get more African-Americans in? Simply doing what you're doing, putting me out there, putting other African-Americans out there who are conservative minded and who can actually speak to the experience, which I think is clearly important. Not people who are going to demean folks. The Bible said with love and kindness have I drawn thee people who are going to really speak to that experience so people can be drawn in. And I'm excited to be a part of that movement. So when you think about that, though, you go back home and you look at South Side Chicago, which has frankly always fascinated me because it has had such an abnormal level of violence. This is a great city. Chicago, there's no automatic reason for that. What do you think are the real obstacles to breaking through? I've always thought that getting a job, having safety, having health, and being able to learn, those four things are the practical reality for normal people. And yet, it seems like in the south side of Chicago, there are problems that are just built in that they don't seem to be able to break through on. Why do you think that is? You know, there's two things that come to mind, and they're reflective of my family. So, People know that I made it out. I've done quite well and continue to do well. And some of my siblings, there's nine of us total. And I have an older brother who's five years older than me. He's 38. And then I have younger siblings. I'm second oldest. My older brother, I hate to say it, but he's really been a career criminal, to be honest with you. He didn't know his father. And he's been getting in trouble with the law since he was about 14 years old. He... Interestingly enough, recently just got out of jail again. So that's, I think, an area where environment plays such an important role. And I have another sibling who recently got into some trouble with the law for the first time ever. And this is a kid who I took him to events with me at a thousand person keynote speech. I'm paying him on my book tour, making sure he's with me just to show him something different. And he can be really exposed because when my family needs money, they call me, hey, this is going on. We're about to be evicted. The lights are off or whatever. And it seems very draconian, but because it is, 
it's harsh, but those are the realities for a lot of African Americans that make it out. There'll be people that pull on your strings because they see no one else. So going back to my younger brother who recently got in trouble with the law and, you know, I've been helping out at the hire an attorney and all of that. And I've been wondering about the reality of the situation in which he's in and it's all about environment for me, a part of it. And then is the fact that people have to want something for themselves. You can get cooked into this environment of crime and drugs and clearly follow that path. You can have a brother who's on national television who's doing well. You can have all of these other things around you. But if you're in these environments and you're in some ways clearly taking part in them and you don't want something greater for yourself, there's nothing you can do. So everyone can't be saved. That's number one. But then there'll be a person who really wants to make it out, who doesn't want that for themselves, like me, for example. And I don't consider myself exceptional by any measure. I think we all have God given potential and it's up to us to bring it out to do something good with it. But in this situation, I believe that it has to be somebody with this desire to make it out. There'll be someone who comes to you and say, hey, I see something great in you. Let me give you a word. They'll give you a word that may change your life or there'll be an active participant in you making it out. So now when it comes to my own family, I'm making sure that I'm a whole lot more active because we can't lose anyone else. There's so much potential in the black community and communities across America. And unfortunately, when it comes to the African-American community, the majority, I think, of that potential lies in the graveyard at this point. So when you go back home with this philosophy and people see you on Fox, they know who you are and they know that you're willing to speak your mind. What do they say to you? What kind of reaction do you get back in the neighborhood you came from? I've been called Uncle Tom, a sellout. How can you be on Fox News? How can you support the president? How can you say anything supportive of him? How can you be a defender? How can you defend conservatives, the conservative movement, any of those things? But then there's some people who say, wow, I'm exceptionally proud of you. I can't agree with your politics, but I'm very proud of you. Or even in some cases, I get people who say, man, I read your book, Taken for Granted, and it's changed my ideas of what the conservative movement is. And now I'm a conservative. So it's been a variety of different responses that I've received from people. But at the same time, it's a tough reality for a lot of people in this place. I think Trump supporters have gotten a little taste of what it feels like to be conservative because they may post something political on social media and their friends unfollow them. Their friends say, I can't be friends with you anymore. So now people are seeing this very different reality. But the truth of the matter is we can't stop speaking. We can't stop saying how we feel about the president. We can't stop saying how we feel about the conservative movement. Even if you have 12 Twitter followers, you should say what you feel. There's not going to be a PC culture that's going to stop us from being unequivocally who we are, saying what we feel and what we demand. There's no shame in that. And the fact that Democrats have created this movement to shame people is disgusting, is disheartening, and it's un-American. So given that strong position, which of course I love, what is your hope for the podcast? Interestingly enough, I have a lot of great hopes here. We're bringing in Folks that are national guests that are very sought after, like Herschel Walker, for example, as well as folks you may have never heard of that talk about a variety of issues, issues that in some cases I may view from a different lens than the party. Maybe we're talking about any particular policy and the party has one way of thinking of it and I think of it in another way. We're going to be challenging views on both sides, whether it be I'm bringing on a Democrat or a Republican or just someone who may be a part of Hollywood who thinks differently and unafraid to speak out against the mob in Hollywood. We're going to be challenging perspectives on all angles so we can make sure that we're more informed about the issue that we're discussing, as well as ensuring that people have a platform to hear all sides of an issue come together. And we're going to do so respectfully. It's going to be an entertaining space for everyone. It's going to be fun. It's going to be informative. And we're going to challenge individuals' way of thinking. I think it's going to be very exciting when you can start as a kickoff with Herschel Walker. You're on the way to having a whole series of great things. So thank you for joining us, Gianno. We are delighted to be working with you. And we wish you luck with the podcast launch. And now, 
I'm going to offer you a sneak preview of Out Loud with John O. Caldwell. Would you mind telling us about your childhood and how you grew up? Well, it's a little bit interesting because everyone, you know, they look at the, uh, I always say they look at the glory, but they don't look at my whole story. And what I mean by that is I didn't grow up in sports. And, you know, everyone just assumed because I'm a football player that I got a lot of escalades or awards and footballs and through athletics that that's all I ever done. But the truth is I never watched sports. The only sports I ever watched was uh, like WWF uh, wrestling and mm-hmm. stuff. And and I knew a lot about that, but I didn't know about sports. And most sports that I've learned has come from books. I grew up a little bit overweight where people said my mom said I was big bone. And uh, I, uh, <laughs> and you know, I, I, uh, I, was, I had a stuttering problem. I used to stutter real bad. And I had kids that picked on me. They used to beat me up. And, and uh, at a point in my life, enough was enough. Uh, you know, I started working out. I started changing everything in my life and so much change in my life. But, uh, you know, the way I was brought up didn't change. And what I mean by that is I was brought up in the church. My mom is a Amen. minister. Amen. And uh, so I have three sisters as ministers. I have two brother-in-laws as a minister. So I was brought up in the church. And I do remember as the kids were picking on me one day, I hid my one pair of Sunday shoes to go to church. And my nickname is Bo. I told my mom I couldn't go to church because I couldn't find my shoes. And she turned to me and she said, Jesus, I don't care how you look. And that really changed my life because, you know, all my life, people are worried about how I look, being overweight, how I sound. And to know someone that didn't care how I look, how I sound, I decided, you know, I want to follow this dude here because this dude here got it going on. So that's how my life sort of changed. And, and that's why I've been blessed through athletics, but also I've been blessed to try to be honest as well, be honest in telling the truth. And, that's why when you talk about talking at the convention, I, I tell people, you know, it's, it's hard that people don't want to know the truth. You know, I'm not here. And one thing that's unique is, you know, I didn't come here to lie to anyone. I came here to tell you the truth. You can like it or not like it. I urge everyone to download this new podcast, Out Loud with John O'Caldwell, on Apple Podcasts, iHeartMedia, or anywhere you get your podcast. You can also find a link to his podcast on our show page at newtsworld.com. Newt's World is produced by Gingrich 360 and iHeartMedia. Our executive producer is Debbie Myers. Our producer is Garnsey Sloan. Our researcher is Rachel Peterson. The artwork for the show was created by Steve Penley. Special thanks to the team at Gingrich 360. Please email me with your questions at gingrich360.com slash questions. I'll answer a selection of questions in future episodes. And if you've been enjoying Newt's World, I hope you'll go to Apple Podcasts and both rate us with five stars and give us a review so others can learn what it's all about. On the next episode of Newt's World, which Supreme Court will America have in 2021? We're really looking at a way of viewing the Supreme Court, whether it is with a Trump re-election and a stable court, but a conservative court for the first time in almost 70 years, or a Biden election, and if the Democrats win the Senate, an effort to pack the court. So which court is a big question? It's the first of our series on Trump's America, which is a new mini-series that we're launching. I'm Newt Gingrich, this is Newt's World. When it comes to what's happening in this country and around the world, the best podcast you can listen to is The Buck Sexton Show. Hey, it's Buck Sexton here. We are in the height of an election season that will determine the future of the country. Who are you going to listen to? Who can you trust? Who could have thought that when people told Democrats they had to treat Wisconsin like a battleground, they would take it quite so literally? iHeartRadio is number one for podcasts, and it's easy to see why. Listen to The Buck Sexton Show on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts. Candace Owens just knocked out Cardi B and poked the biggest hole yet in the stranglehold entertainment and media have on the minds of black voters in this country. I'm Rob Smith, and on the next episode of Rob Smith is Problematic, we are going to break down why the left uses idiots to reach black America 
and how Candace Owens just put them all on notice that they cannot do it anymore. Listen to Rob Smith is Problematic on the iHeartRadio app, on Apple Podcasts, and wherever you get your podcasts.